My name is Michael Patnell. I'm an order partner at Grant Thornton, and I run our asset management group, and I'll be your moderator uh, for today. Adrian Jones, I chair and co-head the private equity business at Goldman Sachs. Gregory Hardiman, managing director at 17 Capital. Mike Arpey, president of Hunter Point Capital. Andrew Almeida, I'm a partner at Toma Bravo. Okay, great. Um, the time that we're gonna spend uh, with you today is gonna be broken into mainly two areas. One will be just a, a private equity outlook, some of the things that we've seen in the past and what's gonna <clears throat> be happening in the next 12 months and then beyond. And then we'll um, switch over to just the different liquidity um, needs of, of private equity and how they are being fulfilled in a lot of different ways in, in, in the market. So um, I think what we'll start, just generally, just a main uh, level field, uh, private equity, maybe we can touch a little bit on, Adrian, um, with your global role, what are you seeing in, in private equity relating to an outlook in not only the US but different parts of the world? Okay, well, first of all, in the US, um, I'm fairly positive about the outlook in the near term, the outlook for 2024. I think it's surprising for a lot of people that tw there was as much activity as there was in, 20 in 23. And, but when you look at the aggregate of activity in 23, it didn't feel like it necessarily. You didn't see big, big sales and big distributions, but there was a great deal of activity, a lot of add-on activity. And if you look at the aggregate of that, it's not far off 2018, 2019. So it's quite a busy year. I expect in the US this year you're going to see more sales. I, I think there's a greater sense of confidence that we'll avoid a recession. Uh, financing market is getting better by the month. I think sellers, and I think there are a lot of pent, there's a lot of sell, sell, pent up selling pressure. A lot of LPs looking uh, for money back and a focus on DPI. And I think that sellers will be getting guided by financiers and advisors to get ready to sell and to move fairly quickly. Um, and, and I think to some degree you'll see the same in Europe, but I think there's a real difference between um, how strong the economy is in the US and, 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 and the strength in Europe. It's very patchy in Europe. Um, Germany is very weak. UK has a lot of challenges post-Brexit. And then other countries, it's, it's, it's somewhat hit or miss, but it's, it's a, a much lower growth environment than it is in the US right now. So that's a challenge both as, as a buyer and as a seller. Um, but the sellers are there, the dry powder is available, and there's a willingness to transact. And the real question, do the sellers emerge uh, in 24? And I think they will. And then lastly, I would say Asia, it's very complicated. You have to go country by country. Uh, we particularly like Japan. We like Korea right now. Um, India is a perennial favorite in terms of growth pro prospects, et cetera, but it, it has its own challenges uh, as a market, uh, particularly when it, when it comes to monetizing. And then China is, is a particular enigma of its own, just given the geopolitical dynamic. Sure, thank you for that. Andrew, can you talk maybe a little bit about, in your area of focus, what you're seeing as far as outlooks um, in the near term and then beyond? Yeah, absolutely, so I focus on large cap uh, software buyouts, specifically of uh, cybersecurity companies. And that's what I've done for the past 12 years at Tomo Bravo. So 2023 was a tough year for, for our business. We powered through it, we delivered great results, but I've been at Tomo Bravo for 12 years. We're historically a fund that raises capital quickly, deploys it quickly, and returns it quickly. And 2023 just felt like the slowest year of my career, just in terms of uh, pace of deployment. And so that was driven by a big disconnect between valuations uh, on the bid and the ask. So there was just a big spread, I think, created by a lot of uncertainty. There was a lot of volatility in the markets. And then companies, specifically in tech, saw uh, fairly material top line slowdowns in, in 2023. 2024 and exiting 2023 is starting to feel like, you know, we're back to maybe 2021 levels, maybe not quite 2021 levels, but you look at where the markets are, we have a lot of favorable things going on from a macro perspective with interest rates coming down, leverage markets reopening up. So it seems like 2024, uh, like Adrian was saying, we had a lot of pent up demand in 2023, 2024 is gonna be a very active year, particularly in tech, which was one of the more volatile sectors in 23. 
Thank you. And how are you seeing, um, maybe within your portfolio, or maybe going forward, that public to private seems to be, is that something you think will um, catch more traction? Yeah, so at our end of the market, we're looking to put in at least a billion and a half dollars of equity into every deal we do. We rely almost solely on the public markets for deal flow, uh, public to private transactions. And you know, going back to that theme of uncertainty, 2023 public company directors and boards, they had a very tough time determining what their companies that they sat on the boards of were worth. Uh, I think that's much more clear now, and so the public to private market will, um, will be really healthy this year, and you know, it's probably a great thing for a lot of people in this room. Excellent. Um, Adrian, if you could talk a little bit about um, acquisitions. I know you mentioned that you think there'll be a lot more, more sales. Um, there's been uh, some changes in fundraising, which we'll get to. But the idea of um, you know, buying a company and now just building upon it instead of buying another company, buy and build, um, are you seeing more of that in the, maybe in the near term? More buy and build? Yeah, to add to current portfolios versus um, new purchases. Well, I think, I think buy and build, um, if you can find the right platform and you can de-risk the business and you find you have a managing team, you always want to put more capital behind a winning team. Um, I think um, it has been, as I mentioned earlier, in 2023 with a tougher financing environment, easier to do smaller deals, mm -hmm. easier to find that financing or to, to infuse more equity uh, to support those, those, uh, those add-ons, um, that, that has been a, a winning um, strategy uh, in 23, and indeed has been a winning strategy for a long time if you do it well. Um, I, I fully expect that there'll be more of that because you know, we're in an environment where if you look over the last 15 years in, in private equity, there's been some enormous capital gains realized a huge amount of it, when you, when you uh, segmented, a huge amount of it was driven by um, multiple expansion. Some elements of deleveraging as well. So think of those as financial engineering. It's great, and they come and go, and you never know what a vintage will be like at the time you make the investment. What, what, what stays consistent over time, though, is the value of being able to truly add operating value, to grow a top line, to expand a margin. And top line growth, be it organic or inorganic, in the case of add-ons, mm -hmm. is, is just such a powerful thing. Yeah. And, and a harder thing to find in a slower growth. Organic growth is harder to come by in a slower growth environment. And we, we are slowing. The economy is strong, but it's slowing. So organic growth gets tougher. And inorganic growth through add-ons uh, becomes more attractive yeah. and also gives you the opportunity to expand margins. So I think there will be more focus on this as a tool of, of growing value at companies. Yeah. And then with always a focus on efficiencies, more focus on efficiencies, while trying to balance different you know, real-time expenses or investments that you have to make in the business. You, know, we, you, know, you mentioned cyber being one that you yeah. know, when we're working with clients, it's always this focus of well, what can you kick down the road versus what do you have to do now to you know, safeguard your company, investors' dollars. So cyber is usually top of the list of things that firms mm -hmm. will you know, contribute to. And then you have maybe some of the automation, AI, yeah things that you could, you, maybe you want to push that forward even though you will get long-term benefits in a lot of different areas as yeah. well as being competitive. Anything on that, the comment? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think what's happening uh, in technology right now is going to be revolutionary across every sector. Mm -hmm. uh, it's going to transform every sector. Um, and we're, we're seeing that and we're, we're in the very early stages of all this. There's a massive willingness within boards and management teams to engage on this, particularly in the United States. And you think, take, take a, a typical CEO of a company who's had a company, who's been investing over the last, who's been running a company over the last four or five years through COVID, having to navigate COVID, then having to navigate inflationary pressures, having to, uh, for many CEOs, having to uh, navigate labor shortfalls, struggling to attract and retain workers. 
and then pay a lot more for those workers. And watching your margins getting crimped and the supply chain pressures and all of that, there, most CEOs I know are salivating for the opportunity to apply more technology to their company and create greater productivity. Mm -hmm. And again, in, for us as, as owners of companies in an environment where financial engineering is not, is not the way to go, you have to be growing value and grow your top line, and there's a technological opportunity there in terms of adding new streams and new, new revenue streams, et cetera. But also the power of productivity and automation is, is extraordinary. And just even art, artificial intelligence, we're in, we're in the very early stages of, of it right now, but for us in our portfolio, we're actively engaged on programs in consumer operations, sales and marketing, coding. There are so many extraordinary opportunities. We're finding more and more opportunities and, and use cases all the time. And we're, and we're in the very early innings. So I think, in some ways, the only constraint on what's going to happen here, there may be, over time, there more, may be more of a political constraint mm. in terms of just the impact it could have on, on labor markets. But for now, it's about our boards willing to fund the capital required. This, this, these are expensive programs. Right. But also, there's a great concern amongst boards and management teams about being the last one to do it. Everyone's watching their neighbors and what their competitors are doing. Um, and so there's a focus on making sure you're out there early. There's a little bit of an arms race going on. Yeah. And so it's, it's a very exciting time from that perspective. Thank you. Uh, Andrew, anything to add specifically maybe on the, the cyber lens and what you're seeing companies and how they're, they're you know, earmarking dollars for this type of risk and you know, real need expense? Yeah, so this is something that cyber companies have always had to deal with because cyber is a constant game of cat and mouse. And so every day, bad guys are getting badder. And so there's no resting on your laurels or postponing investments. Um, we always laugh uh, at our companies because we've been talking about AI for you know the past 10 years, and it's just become a really big buzzword today. And so everyone asks, like, what are you doing about AI? It's, you know, we've been embracing AI for the past 10 years. And so... Um, <clears throat> I, you know, fortunately, I get to work in an industry where I don't have to make those decisions too often about invest now or you know kick right. the can down the road. We're we're always kind of pedal to the metal on innovation. Yeah, and you know you're helped by I think you know every major um, you know periodical when there's these breaches and and what happens to their whether it's their stock price or the company itself. It really has a you know you know investors and just even people with their personal information. Um, you know, with, with, within the organization. So we're about halfway now, and I think we'll, we'll switch a little bit now to some liquidity trends that are impacting, uh, you know, private equity. And I'd like to uh, have Michael, maybe if you could uh, start um, with the three major items. We'll, we'll start with um, GP stakes and how you think about that for a company, a private equity group, when, when best to come in on the life cycle, and then what value is created um, when making an investment from your firm. Yeah. Um, so first, thank you uh, <clears throat> for, for having us on the panel. Uh, so I think we're at uh, GP Financing 2.0 today in the marketplace. I think uh, it used to be that people would think about staking transactions or NAV lending or preferred equity as just a financial transaction. And today, uh, I think the market has evolved uh, such that people are looking for strategic partners for growth. They are, they're looking to take financing uh, from people who they believe can add value uh, to them. The money is important. It's necessary, but not sufficient. Uh, and when they think about taking money, uh, from somebody who could be a strategic partner for growth. They're thinking about that in terms of, you know, is the person who's, who's providing the capital uh, independent and unconflicted? To the extent that you're gonna finance somebody, you have to provide a lot of information to them. And if, the, if that party is gonna turn around the next day and compete with you, uh, they probably don't like that. That's probably something uh, that would be a, would be a hindrance uh, the, and so what we're finding uh, for ourselves is that uh, because uh, investors often come in and they don't know whether equity or debt is the right solution for them, uh, we have a broad funnel. And so we're able to see and really be solution-based in terms of how it is that we uh, approach the market. I think uh, the big thing that when you talk about being a strategic partner for growth, 
Uh, GPs are looking for help with fundraising. They're looking for help in lowering their costs through things like group purchasing. Uh, they're looking for talent management assistance strategy, help with ESG. These are things that are on their minds and they want firms that could really help them with that. Great. And you mentioned a lot of the positives of doing you know, one of these GP stakes. What are, what are some of the negatives and some of the ways that if someone's thinking about doing this, they really should be focusing in on? Yeah. Well, you want to, when you look at, particularly on the staking side, you want to understand what the motivations are. If somebody um, is taking a stake uh, because uh, they want to cash out and they want to buy a bigger boat, that's, that's probably not a transaction we're going to do and that we're not interested in. Uh, so there are two types of sellers in the market. Uh, there are people who sell on the basis of price, and there are people who sell because they're looking for, for a value-add partner. Uh, we're squarely in the strategic partner for growth mode and not the, uh, not, not the people who are looking just to cash out. Uh, and so I think, uh, depending on what the person's uh, or people's motivations are, that really dictates uh, how viable a transaction is. I think if someone's just looking to cash out, in other words, taking the money and putting it in their pocket, as opposed to investing it back into the business, it creates a huge misalignment of interest. So what we're interested in when we look at a transaction is what is the use of proceeds? What are they gonna be doing uh, with the money? Uh, to make sure that they're investing in the long term because ultimately where we derive value is on the long term growth of, um, uh, of the GPs we finance. And what about, you know, you enter into this and then, you know, within a shorter period of time than expected, they want to, um, you know, end the relationship, you know, pay you back. Is there severe, you know, issue, penalties, disadvantages of doing that? So we had a situation on our staking fund, our second investment, uh, was with a, uh, with uh, public information, was with a firm called Iron Park, um, uh, backed, uh, it was by a fellow whose name is Trip Smith. He was the S of Blackstone GSO. Uh, and uh, what happened there was we made the uh, investment in January of 2022, uh, and we started helping them raise money. We raised a significant amount of money uh, for him. General Atlantic, uh, came along and uh, thought, well, maybe down the road they might, uh, th they might purchase them or take a stake in them, uh, but decided, given the pace of uh, activity that we were involved in, to disrupt that slower process and came in and, and bought uh, Iron Park outright eight months. Uh, and we generated a, a, a very nice uh, return for our investors uh, as a result of that. But that was prompted by the are being a strategic partner for growth uh, for for Iron Park. There was uh, we had a we had minimum MOIC protections mm -hmm. there mm -hmm. uh, that allowed us to generate an outsized return, even though it was a short period of time. Great, That's an excellent story there, um, Greg. Maybe we'll uh, switch a little bit to you to talk a little bit about preferred equity. A little, you know, more of a non-dilutive uh, maybe answer to the liquidity need. Sure, sure, and I'll and I'll answer it broadly because it is it is very relevant uh, to the topics that Mike was hitting on uh, around capital needs of the GP, right? But the the space that we're looking at extends far beyond that, right? So we're working with the general partners themselves, right? So whether it's the management company of the firm or the senior team, right? We're working with the private equity funds, right? So providing capital that is ultimately senior to the LPs in that fund. And then we're working with the, the LPs directly on their interests, right? And some of the dynamics that Adrian and Andrew have, have referenced around a uh, more challenging exit environment, ultimately that means slowdown in realizations to LPs, which leads to more challenging fundraising conditions. All of that creates liquidity needs across the system, right? And we're participants in an ecosystem which is now proliferated where there is a wider range of liquidity options for all stakeholders in private equity, right? Whether it's GP stakes, whether it's NAV financing, whether it's the secondaries, uh, secondary market, right? Enabling folks to manage their cash flow profile, manage their exposure, and continue to, to reinvest even if um, liquidity coming back via exits is not as robust, right? So specific to the question around preferred equity, 
GPs now are considering a full range of capital structure solutions, right? So they, they may have an equity partner. Uh, they may choose to utilize financing. It, it, often, it's, it, it can be both over time, right? It depends on the life cycle of the firm and their, their objectives over the next three or five years. And you know, obviously, this is something that has been you know, increasing. There's been a lot more focus on it. Seems like the outlook that we heard may show that there's going to be some sales, that maybe this liquidity that is needed may come from some of the sales in, in, the, uh, in, the, in the normal you know, course, interest rates coming down. Now, that's going to be a long period of time before that happens. But do you, do you believe that that will change, this, this need for liquidity? Is, is it something that, how, how far out are you, are you thinking it's going to take? Or is it something yeah. that just different ways of doing business now for good? Yeah. The more challenging liquidity environment, it, it supports demand for NAV finance today, but it's a much longer term phenomenon, right? So if I, I think about fund level financing activity, which is most relevant to, to Adrian and Andrew, right? The primary use case for that is add on M&A, right? Buy and build strategies aren't going away. So buy and build representing a larger portion of private equity activity, that's been going up for years, right? It's accelerated since 2022. Uh, but what that means, what we see, right, longer hold periods, continued buy and build, that requires more investment capacity for, for private equity funds that are, that are in the ground today. Right? That is a big um, demand driver for fund level finance. And again, it's very relevant now when it's challenging to exit companies, but uh, that demand exists even in a more robust liquidity environment. And then with different sectors that this would not really pertain to, are there any specific type of um, you know, closed-end vehicles, fund managers that doesn't work, you, you don't see it as much, and it's something that you're not writing? I, I would love uh, Michael's perspective as well. I think what our firm focuses on is, is closed-ended asset classes, right? So private equity, we can uh, look outside of that infrastructure um, and other real assets to some extent. Uh, where we haven't focused would be on liquid underlying open-end fund type structures, right? So we're not working with, with hedge funds. Uh, we're really focused on portfolios of private assets where we're interfacing with the manager and steward of those assets who's driving the value creation day to day. Yeah. Michael? Yeah, so um, we do focus on private equity, uh, but we also have had very good success in private credit uh, in terms of uh, financing. One of the reasons, again, is because we're independent and unconflicted. Uh, so when, when a private credit firm looks to uh, do something uh, in terms of a, a liquidity uh, opportunity, they want to transact with someone who isn't going to compete with them. Uh, and so uh, private credit has been a big uh, focus of ours. Uh, infrastructure, we'll soon talk about real estate. Uh, as one of our opportunities. Uh, so, and this translates both in terms of what we're doing on the staking side, as well as on the nav lending or preferred equity side. Just to define what preferred equity is, because I think it's important, uh, is there's two ways that GPs get financing. One is to sell a stake, and a second way is to borrow against the management company of the general partner. Uh, and so we have both tools in our toolkit uh, that we can wield with GPs, depending on where they are in their life cycle and what they're doing, uh, as well as doing the NAV financing. Excellent. And we have a couple of minutes left, and I want to come back to uh, Adrian, talk a little bit about, um, we, we talked about investing, didn't talk as much about fundraising, and the opportunity that private equity could start going into the retail you know, market. There's been a lot of rules that have changed for private funds, that private fund rule that's out, that's being litigated, that is creating a, a, a huge cost and extra regulatory uh, burden, if you will. So there's a lot of focus in that retail sector that uh, as an attraction for capital for private equity. And could you just yep. give us a little bit about what you're seeing there and then what the outlook would be for the future? Yeah, for many of the, the largest uh, and most established firms in, uh, in private equity, in some ways retail, and particularly U.S. retail, consumer retail, uh, represents the last frontier of, of capital that we, we haven't yet um, accessed. And I, I think it's a very interesting point for the industry in terms of both the maturity 
of the industry. The industry has been developing now for, it's, it's, in, it's in its fifth decade. Uh, it's become established, it's become understood. You've also got great data on the resilience of portfolios, and indeed the resilience of individual companies if they're appropriately capitalized, but certainly of the funds. Uh, you also have regulation, as you said, there's greater transparency, and there probably will be more. Mm -hmm. And so all of that um, raises the question, is this an interesting time? And we, we have an interesting perspective on this at Goldman because private equity at Goldman started investing the partner's capital in the 1980s. And then just over 30 years ago in 92, we invited our clients, and, and primarily well, uh, wealthy individuals, founders, families um, who were part of our wealth management program, they got the opportunity to invest alongside uh, the partnership and the partners and the investing team. And that's been our model for 30 years, that alignment. But, so in, in a strange way, we started in the retail world as distinct from the institutional investor world. And so we've been, we've been operating now, obviously that's a particular type of retail investor. It's a high-end retail investor. But certainly, we've watched that uh, over time. Uh, and we think it's, a, it's, it's actually a really interesting time for broader-based retail programs. I think the industry is ready. I think the, the regulation, the oversight is, is robust. Um, and uh, I think it's, it's actually very exciting. Yeah, having the ability for individuals from a 401k plan and yeah. different yeah. getting into that, that yeah. private. There's, there's a great deal of education that needs to take place. And, and you know, I, I'm sure the, me the media will occasionally be fixated on the blow ups and the, and the problems and the challenges. But private equity has become ubiquitous, it has become established uh, you know, within communities. Uh, and, and people have a much greater sense of what it is. Yeah. Than, and uh, it's understood. And also, frankly, for your 401k plans, there are fewer places to go. That's right. So people want access to that alpha as well. So there's a question of making sure people have adequate um, education and are taking the appropriate risk levels. And so there, I think there will be a, a lot of uh, focus on the quality of the advice people are getting. But I think it's an idea that it's time has come. Yeah, the traction's there, and it'll just continue to involve. Yes. Yeah. Well, I'd like to thank the entire panel uh, for today and the audience for their attention. And we are concluded off to lunch, I believe. So thank you all.